welcome and thank you so much for joining us for another amazing episode of The Nonprofit Show. Today's guest is Jan Glick with Jan Glick and Associates. And Jan's gonna talk to us a little bit or a lot of it about nonprofit mergers and acquisitions. And I'm really thrilled to have you joining us uh, today, Jan. Before we get started into the conversation, Julia and I are here. Want to make sure that you know who we are as well. Julia is the CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. I'm Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd that even Jan said that he didn't wear his nerd glasses today, but I have them. So we're we're good. And of course, we want to say thank you to our presenting sponsors that keep this show going and growing. So thank you to Bloomerang, to the American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy, Nonprofit Nerd, your part-time controller, the Nonprofit Atlas, Nonprofit Thought Leader, as well as Staffing Boutique. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And of course, if you're interested in re-watching or sharing any of our episodes with your contacts, you can find us on Roku, YouTube, Fire TV. Vimeo, and now in podcast form. So we are uh, a little bit everywhere and we're still working on that hologram that I talk about where you'll just say the nonprofit show and Julie and I just kind of like hologram right into your office or living room or conference, wherever you might be. So thank you again to our uh, presenting sponsors that help us keep this the show going. And Jan, back to you. I'm thrilled to have you. Uh, we connected through a mutual friend and a mutual connection and uh, just thrilled to have you here talking to us today about mergers and acquisitions. Welcome. Well, Jared, thanks for the invitation. Julia, thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here um, and, uh, and live. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Before we get going, talk to us about Jan Glick and Associates, because we're narrowing down your brain power into one little area, but I think you do a lot more than this. And so kind of give us, if you will, a framework, Jan, so we can kind of understand how you came to be so prolific in this space. Thanks, Julia. Um, yeah, we, we formed the company 26 years ago. Um, I'd been um, um, actually an engineer originally. I owned a retail business here in a big shopping mall in the Seattle area, um, and then kind of left the corporate world and was the executive director of an environmental organization and decided that when I left the environmental organization, I wanted to build a, um, a consulting management consulting firm serving the nonprofit sector. Mostly we do some government consulting as well, but, but all public sector and really build it based on data and research, um, a number of which uh, we develop. And, and over the years, that's developed into a business. If you look at our website, we really do four things. We do the mergers and acquisitions, which we're going to talk about in a minute. We do a lot of executive search all across the country, almost exclusively for nonprofit executive directors and CEOs, strategic planning, and then last but not least, I did write the first book ever on nonprofit turnarounds, um, moving nonprofits from that are struggling uh, towards success. Wrote that, that was published in 2010. So uh -huh. thanks for asking, Julia. Okay, so now I'm like so impressed. We really have to pay attention <laughs> because this is a big topic. Um, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm just like totally... I have so many questions that I want to ask, but I think the first one is what it what is the difference, the key elements between a merger and an acquisition and an acquisition? You know, we don't see this a lot as in the nonprofit sector as probably as much as we should. And so how do you kind of give us that lens before we start peppering you with so many questions? Yeah, yeah. And so it's a great first question. Um, the difference between a merger and an acquisition in the nonprofit world, and you're going to hear me a few times differentiate nonprofit mergers and acquisitions from for profit. They're, they're actually quite different uh, in terms of what happens and what doesn't happen. But the, the biggest difference between a merger and acquisition is, um, you know, it, it's a legal distinction and it's a terminology distinction. So uh, if you have one organization with 10 boards, board members, and another with 10 board members, um, but only three come across, right? So the new, the new nonprofit has 13 board members, 10 from one and three from the other. Um, that's a fairly common structure. 
Yeah. Right. And one could argue that's really an acquisition because they're outnumbered 10 to three. But um, but depending on the legal structure, that could have been legally constructed as a merger. Um, so the factors that play into merger versus acquisition, um, it's terminology, it's number of board seats, um, which corporation, which legal status remains after the integration. Right. So you have to be one single nonprofit corporation. You can't be two. Mm -hmm. And depending on how that negotiation worked out, it could tip toward a merger versus an acquisition. The last thing I will say on this is it's all about brand and perception. Mm -hmm. And a lot of deals that are actually acquisitions, right? So say that the smaller, the, the less, mm -hmm. the, the weaker, to, to use that term, um, say the weaker nonprofit only gets one or two board seats. Most of the nonprofit deals that we do are announced as mergers because both parties decide it's better for the community. It's better for the clients we serve to have this be seen as a merger rather than acquisition. So those are just some of the subtleties. It's a really a subtle distinction. So never did you mention ego, Jan. That, did, <laughs> that didn't come up in any of those two definitions. And I'm curious, and, and Julia you know, said, we don't hear about this mm -hmm. often probably not often enough. And the number we throw out is 1.8 million. And perhaps that's changed, but you know, roughly 1.8 million non-registered nonprofits in the United States. How many, and just a ballpark, or if you happen to know the statistic, that's even better. But how many you know, organizations do undergo a merger and acquisition process? Yeah. I don't know, let's say like on an annual basis. Do we, do we have a clue? We don't, you know, as as you both know, um, the nonprofit sector is so under-resourced, underfunded, there, there tends to not be a lot of data developed. There, there's not a lot of money into, you know, put into from the big funders into that kind of systemic sector-wide work. And funders for years, 20, 30 years, as long as I've been in the business, have always wanted to um, sort of incentivize nonprofits to come together because that that of that 1.8 million the average nonprofit as you know is under a million dollars in size which is the size of a postage stamp right it's, you're talking three four staff is a typical nonprofit and so it's hard to really change the world which is what all of us want to do with three four or five staff mm -hmm. um, where the ego comes in and this comes across both in my book and we also published a white paper which is available on our website janglick.com um, published that in 2020, the first year of the pandemic. Uh, and it's entitled 26 Consolidations Since the Great Recession. So since the 08, 09 recession, right. we've done 26 of these mergers and acquisitions um, before the, the pandemic recession. And that white paper talks about the characteristics of those 26 deals. And where the ego comes in is that that's what prevents that 1.8 million from getting smaller. The number of nonprofits in the US only goes in one direction. It goes up and up and up, despite everybody's still small. Mm -hmm. And so where the ego comes in is that boards of directors and executive directors and CEOs really hang on. And even if the organization's kind of limping along and struggling, they don't really want to say uncle and, and, and approach, approach um, a larger, a more effective organization across town or across the county that has more capacity, that has stronger systems, has a stronger brand, and may be able to pursue that mission. And that's where the ego comes in. And yeah. the folks that approach us to uh, help facilitate a deal are the ones that are fairly egoless and, and really understand that they're there for the community and not for their own you know, ego. Mm -hmm. Well, and they've probably, my assumption is they've probably also done a lot of due diligence to see some solutions. One of the things, you know, that I've learned through the third sector academy um, and the, the interim executive academy rather is the consideration of the mergers and acquisitions. And so, you know, learning that that's an option, that there's, you know, professionals out here that can serve nationally. And that's something you had shared with us is that you have served in this capacity across the nation, multiple states. And so that's a really good resource. And you mentioned these 26 characteristics or the, the, the characteristics of these 26. And that sounds like a good spring break reading for me. So I can't wait to dive into that. Yeah. Sounds good. 
Yeah, I need to know that because I think that, um, you know, this is the sort of thing that is a, can be a positive guidance mm -hmm. for an organization versus, you know, to enter into that, that world of the ego as a failure. And especially with founder syndrome and all of these organizations that are so tied to their mission in an emotional way rather than a statistical way or, you know, really understanding what are some of the hard facts it's, it's kind of one of those, those things. And that leads me to, I think our next question, and that is what is this process? I mean, it, it, how do you, how do you get leadership involved? I mean, talk to us about what this even looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so um, a few kind of top line comments, first of all, a, um, there are two decisions that nonprofits make that I call the ultimate governance decisions. Right, and we work on both of those. And one is selecting a new executive director or CEO, yeah. and the other is entering into a merger or an acquisition. Right, it's the same decision. Who's going to run your organization? <laughs> right, is it this person or is it this organization? Right, and I call this the ultimate governance issue. And so it's a board decision. Uh, only board members have votes, and typically it's a consensus decision. Um, we we rarely see a board vote to merge or vote to be acquired. Uh, without unanimity of the board. And, and boards will spend uh, a pretty significant amount of time trying to um, really convince the, you know, the one or two naysayers on the board. So, so it's a governance decision. Um, usually the executive director, though, as in all other aspects of nonprofits, really does all the due diligence, you know, has the main relationship with the, you know, with their counterpart, CEO, and the other organization. Uh, spends a lot of time really working with their board and the merger committee. Um, so that's one aspect of it. Really, it's a governance decision. Um, the other aspect is, um, uh, you know, the process itself, there's an increasing amount. If you just imagine just a, a steady ramp up of the word Jared mentioned a minute ago, due diligence. Yeah. So there are, you know, two or three or four phases in any merger acquisition process of due diligence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning, it's, you know, CEO A talks to CEO B and, 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 you know, tries to figure out if it's a good fit. Is the other party interested? Does it feel like a good fit? And there are two kinds of fits. One, one fit is we do the same thing. And so if we put our efforts together, we're larger, we have more scale. Sure. That's what we call... Um, complementary fit, right? And supplemental fit is, um, you know, organization A does healthcare, but doesn't have mental health in their organization and organization B does mental health. So they merge mental health and physical health. So those are kind of two different ways of looking at fit. And, uh, and as, as the CEOs explore this, they, they will then go to their boards and say, I think there's some, you know, there's some there there. We should really explore this further. Can we, can we establish a merger committee and can we sign a non-disclosure agreement with this other organization to start exploring the deal and keep it confidential? And so it's just simply an agreement to talk. And then the next phase, if the talks go well between the two committees and with all the paperwork exchanged, if the talks go well, the next gate to go through is typically a non-binding memorandum of understanding. Okay. Th this says we've been dating for a little while and we now have the ring on our finger. Right, that we're kind of, we're kind of, but you can always take the ring off still, right? When you <laughs> when you get that engagement ring, you can always take it off. That's right. Uh, right, until the actual marriage is done. That's right. That's right. So the, the MOU is non-binding. <clears throat> and then there's one more phase <clears throat> where there's more due diligence, more paperwork exchange, more exploration. And that's the phase which we call structuring the deal. <clears throat> that's where we figure out the number of board seats. That's where we figure out, um, Oh, uh, Jan was the CEO of the small organization, but this other one's so much bigger. Let's see if we can make Jan the vice president of Department X. And you know, we, when we structure the deal, come up with the specific terms and conditions of exactly how these two organizations fit together. And usually that's the point at which when the deal is structured, then you sign the final binding merger agreement or asset transfer agreement, whichever the legal structure is. Uh, so it's an increasing series of due diligence, an increasing series of exploration, and increasingly committed. You know, at the, at the beginning, you're not committed, you're exploring. At the end, you're very committed. 
Mm-hmm. So wow. I, I know I'm like, I'm like, know, <laughs> yeah. at what, at what point in this process, Jan, should these organizations bring in uh, a, a professional like yourself? Right. When do we start engaging in this conversation? And second, second question of this, should we have two of these professionals? Like, should one represent one organization and the other represent the other? Great yeah. question. Yeah, these, these, are, these are really great questions. Great really, questions. Really important questions. Um, so the answer is um, bring in the professional with nonprofit merger experience mm-hmm. pretty early. Not, not, you know, not necessarily the very first time you talk to your other CEO counterpart. And not necessarily the second meeting, but but kind of before you have a committee or as you're forming a, a committee of your board, get that merger, that nonprofit merger consultant on board. And I differentiate the nonprofit from the for-profit because the for-profit, um, there are many things about for-profits that nonprofits should use, but there are also many, many things which really don't apply. <clears throat> and, and because a for-profit merger is based on the value of the stock shares. Yeah. And it's all about making money for the corporate shareholders. We don't have stock in nonprofits. It's right. not about money. And, non, uh, and for-profit consultants and for-profit attorneys can really sink a deal because they try and assign value um, when what our sector is all about is helping the community. Mm-hmm. And, and so when I say, and when you ask, and when I say get a nonprofit merger expert, yeah. nonprofit's the key word. The right. other word, merger, this is not like strategic planning. This is not like facilitation. This is not like fundraising. Um, there's a very small number of, of nonprofit MA experts in the United States. Um, we, we've met a few others. I, I've, I've met colleagues kind of like myself who have done over 10 deals. Met one in Chicago, met one in Boston. There's probably 10 or 15. David LaPiana wrote the book on nonprofit mergers about 25 years ago. He's in San Francisco. There's probably less than a dozen of us in the United States. Um, And so bring them in early. Don't bring the attorneys in early, though. Bring the attorneys in late. Um, Because even if it's a nonprofit attorney, um, the structuring of the deal is not a legal structuring of the deal. The structuring of the deal is staff positions, board positions, branding. It's all the things that nonprofit leaders understand. You bring attorneys in sort of, you heard all the milestones, right? The non-binding MOU versus the binding agreement. So oftentimes we write the non-binding MOU because we have, you know, 35 templates, um, but we bring in the attorney before the binding agreement. So um, attorneys are trained um, to defend their client and to represent their client. And to your last question, Jared, is it one consultant or two? Um, so even when we represent the smaller entity, the smaller nonprofit, we're usually looking at the deal from the lens of how do you help the community the most? Yeah. How can you structure this new larger entity to best serve the community? So even when we're representing the smaller guy, we're kind of representing the community, sure. right? Who, who's the client, right? The board represents the community served. Right. The board represents the public. So we try to represent the, the best, you know, Mm-hmm. interest, if you will, of the mission. So, so we've done about uh, 25% of our deals. We've been hired by both parties. Mm-hmm. About 75% were hired by the, what I call a partner seeking partner to keep on with the relationship and marriage metaphors. Yeah, really interesting. I mean, I would imagine that um, it's really a function of, as Jared said, right out the gate letting those egos go by the wayside, that if you have leadership that is um, really looking towards the community issue, they're gonna be easier and they will be, they'll, they'll work with one individual, they'll work with one company. But if the ego piece gets too convoluted, then I can see where then there's that desire to get my own representation and you know, on, and all of that. Yeah. But otherwise, I, I kind of see it as a, a mediation, you know, it's yeah. like, yeah. as you said, Jen, you're representing the community, you know, the cause, the mission and looking at that. So when you do this, can you talk to us about what success looks like? Like, how do we know that we've achieved a successful merger 
and or acquisition, uh, what are we looking for? What's the end goal here? Yeah. So um, back to percentages uh, again, we, we've seen, um, you know, we did our first partnership. It wasn't a merger, but it was a multi-party partnership back in 1998. So we've been doing this for 24 years and we've done something like 35, 37 deals now of which around 80% have come to fruition, around 20% didn't come to fruition. So we've had all these experiences with different structures and about about 15% or so are kind of best case situations where two strong organizations are really smart, right? These are two strong, well-led organizations and they, and they realize they'd be even stronger if they come together. Okay. That's the best case, but we only see it about one time out of six. And, and over the years, more and more, I mean, what mergers and acquisitions are driven by, they're driven by financial struggle struggle to make ends meet. And so it's usually the small entity approaching the bigger entity, the weaker entity approaching the stronger entity. And so what makes it successful is continuity of mission, continuity of services that, so we had, uh, we did a merger of a community mental health center here in King County, Washington into a hospital system about four or five years ago. So this was a $45 million um, Community Mental Health Center with 650 employees. And the CEO you know, spoke on a panel that I was facilitating a couple of years later. And the CEO said, look, you know, I'm, I'm 66 years old, you know, in 30 years when I'm you know, dead and buried, I'll know that my 650 employees lived on you know, in the hospital system, that that mental health division of the hospital system is thriving. And that the thing that I spent 17 years leading, it lives on. And so that is absolutely the number one um, goal uh, and, and what indicates success. Um, you heard me mention job retention. Um, I think that's a really important point that people, this is one of the confusing things. When people hear merger, all the coverage in the, in the media is around corporate mergers. And everybody knows in a corporate merger, there's thousands of jobs lost. That is completely different in nonprofit deals. It's 100% different. There's hardly ever any job loss. And the reason why is because nonprofits are tiny um, and there's never enough frontline workers. There's never enough social workers. There's never enough you know, artists for the arts organization. There's never enough environmental advocates for the environment. You know, so the frontline workers, they're almost, you know, and this is a clause in all the deals. There's a guarantee to retain the staff. Yeah. And in the occasional case where the CEO loses their job, it's often an interim CEO who will initiate the deal or, or the CEO is ready to move on or they become a vice president or, you know, but if there's ever any job loss, it's often the CEO or maybe the CFO and it's, it's a minuscule percentage of all these deals. So it's mission retention, it's staff retention um, are the biggest indicators of success. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm so glad that you you have said all that you've said, Jan. You're a very brilliant mind. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, as you mentioned earlier, the nonprofit sector is under-resourced by so many ways. Mm -hmm. And staff, the workforce, is, is a big one. And so looking at these mergers as an opportunity to serve the community in a greater way often means keeping all of the staff, right? And as you said, we're never, you know, we're never in abundance of social workers. We're never in abundance of um, this, this help. It's even better than that, right? Because one of the problems when you work in a nonprofit, there's very little career track, right? Yeah. If, if you work in a 10 person nonprofit, there, you're either, you know, a program person, an administrative person, or the executive director. There's only like two levels. Right. Everybody reports to the executive director. <clears throat> you get acquired by a 50 person nonprofit. Now all of a sudden you have like three layers of management. You have a career path all of a sudden. Yeah. Um, benefits are typically better, the larger the nonprofit is. Professional development training is better. So there's a whole lot of things that makes it better for staff, even though staff are worried when they hear the M word, they worry about job loss. And in fact, they should be like thrilled <laughs> because yeah. all of a sudden there's going to be more opportunity for them. Yeah. That's a great point, which comes down to communication, right? It's how do we how do we communicate this to all stakeholders, um, internal, external, 
and uh, you know, to to state that this is this is for the greater good of the community. Yeah, and the communications plans as part of the merger process are really interesting because you have to sort of keep a lot of these discussions confidential initially, you know, within a small circle of board and senior management. Um, And you're ready to sort of take the wraps off when you get late in the process and announce it. And so that messaging is always a very key part of the process. Um, but But it's kind of held until late, until there's clearly a deal. And then the very, the, the very top thing, right, for the internal messaging is job retention. Yeah, Mark, we don't have a lot of time left with you, but you've covered so many things that I, I'm fascinated with. And I see the pattern. I see the trajectory of marching through and being successful. And I realize that all deals are, you know, different. But could you give us an idea for how much time we would need to invest in this or see this through? Like, what does that look like? Yeah, and we have, um, if you go to our website, um, both through the uh, merger drop-down menu and the resources menu, we have, a, we have both that white paper on there. And we also have a merger PowerPoint on there. And there's one slide that talks about what's a fast deal and what's a slow deal. Okay, great. But, so the average, the average deal um, is seven, eight, nine months from start to closing, um, you say six to 12. Um, and we've done some that have moved super fast um, at four months, just, you know, where, where the CEO is really ready. It's a small organization. They control a lot and they can sort of, you know, move it fast. Uh, and we've done a couple. I mean, one, we had a big deal and the pandemic just stopped it. We had, we had a, um, a couple, you know, very large nonprofits, 25 million, $100 million organizations trying to come together. And that had been going on for 18 months when the pandemic hit two years ago and just put a, just stopped it. Um, So the pandemic has stopped a lot of activity because people have been able to get together. Mm -hmm. People have been hunkered down for two years. Um, But roughly speaking, the, the longer ones might be 18 months, two years. And that, that's a long time you know, to, to kind of work out, do we come together or do we not? But that's the range. Wow. Fascinating topic. And um, I know I wish we had more time because I know we could talk for, for hours, but I am going to take a look at your website and these resources that you mentioned. So thank you, Jan, for all that you and your associates do around the nation. We are so very fortunate to have you not only here as our guest, but truly in the sector serving serving the community. So thank you. Thanks, Jarrett. Thanks, Julie. It's been a pleasure to be on your show. Oh my gosh, it's been great. And you know, um, you've really touched on so many of the backstory issues that lead us to this discussion. And so um, thank you very, very much. And I too will, will take a look at the, the white papers that you have um, because this is with the, with the change of the pandemic moving into an endemic phase, I think these things are gonna come back up. I mean, I think some of these discussions are gonna be uh, front and center. And so we're thrilled that there are people like you out there that are doing this. Here's Jan's information, janglick.com. Check them out and see what's cooking um, and how this might be a strategy for you. Again, I'm Julia Patrick. I've been joined by my trusty co-host today, Jarrett Ransom, CEO of the Raven Group, also known as the Nonprofit Nerd. Again, we want to thank all of our presenting sponsors. Without them, we would not be here. Bloomerang, the American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Nonprofit Nerd, Fundraising Academy, Nonprofit Atlas, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and Staffing Boutique. And as we end every episode, we want to remind everyone to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow.